Goeiemorgen vrienden, uh, baie dankie dat jylle my toegelaat het om uh, gister sy recording oor te doen vandag, dat um, gister aand het ek en om daar wat lang gewerk aan die settings in die goeie, so dit raak elke dag beter en vandag sorteer ek nog bykie die klank uit, ek het bykie hulp ingekry, so ek geloof die klank gaan ook begin beter raak. <coughs> ek vraag net vandag voordat ons begin dat um, die van jylle wat miskien vandag een tykie kry sal bid saam met my, my boetie sy seen Tian is in China, hy het gaan school gee daar, en hy het vir hom gearresteer. So hy sit thans in die tronk in China, hy het sê sy papierwerk en goed was nie recht nie, maar dit is nie die waarheid, en hy het alles recht gedoen, volgens die, die visums, en wat die school waar hy onderwijs gee, gesê het hy moet doen, hy het die ambassades gewerk, so ons weet nie in wat sy tronk hy is nie, sy ouwers kan om nie in die hande kry nie, um, ja, so ek bid dat jylle net saam met my sal vertrou dat vader die dere sal oopmaak, dat hulle hom maar net deporteer terug sit Afrika, toe dat hy net weer veilig by sy familie kan wees. <coughs> Goed, dan het ons vandag session 14, Genesis 7 vers 11 en 21, en Genesis 8 vers 1 to 4. Kom ons lees Psalm vers 11 van Genesis 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second moon, in the 17th day of the moon, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of the heavens were opened. Scientist complains that we believe in a fairy tale when we believe in Noah's flood and Noah's ark. But the Bible is, is much more scientific. We don't have to stand back for any scientists or any professors or any people that say they've got a logical mind and we've got a fairy tale mind. They complain that just by raining, there will not be enough water to cover the whole face of the earth. But I suggest to them that they must actually read what the word says, like we just read it, verse 11. Remember we touched on the firmament in Genesis 1, Genesis 1 verse 7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And the windows of the heavens, like we read now in verse 11, the windows of the heavens were opened. This was not just a couple of raindrops and a couple of clouds that brought enough water to fill the whole earth. The word of God says, the firmament divided the water above it from the water below it. So when the windows, and to read more about the windows of, of heavens, we can read that in the book of Enoch. So when the windows of the heavens were opened, you can imagine, it's like, it's like the, the walls of a dam that's opened. And all that tons and tons and tons of water behind the dam wall starts rushing through those wall openings. <clears throat> it's the same with the firmament. When the windows, like verse 11, and the windows of the heavens were opened, when those windows were opened, all that water that the firmament divided, that was above the firmament, just rushed in and filled the earth like a teacup. <clears throat> The word firmament in Hebrew is Strong's H7549, Rakia. And you can do this again. For yourself, you can go and Google the Strong's definition. And I like the BDB definition that you also find on Esword. It explains what the word firmament means. Listen to this. Extended surface. Solid, expanse, firmament. It's a flat as a base. It's a support. It's a vault of heaven supporting the waters above. It's considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above. This is not what I'm saying. This is the definition of this Hebrew word, rakia. And just keep it in mind, this is not a doctrinal issue. But there's so much deception in the science and what 
our children are being taught and what we have been taught. There's just so much deception. Let's, let's just decide. We're not going to make up any new doctrines now. We're just going to look at what the Bible says. And the windows were opened and waters just flood the earth. <clears throat> Those of you that had science and biology in school, you also know that water always finds its own level. It cannot bend. Water cannot bend around a round surface. The firmament has windows. In the firmament, God placed the sun, the moon, and the stars. Remember Genesis 1.14. And the Bible says, the earth is God's footstool. Just something to keep in mind. We'll talk about the biology and the cosmology. We'll talk about it every now and again. But slowly but surely, let's start and and investigate how the Bible describes this heaven and earth that God created, how the Bible says this cosmology is. Let's jump to verse 21. And all the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl and cattle and beast and every creeping thing and every man. Where did all the huge oil reserves we have today come from? The scientist explains that oil is organic material that's been compressed under pressure under the, under the earth. And again, we've got the answer. All the plants, all the trees, all the fowls and beasts and cattle and men, everything was compressed under the earth during this flood. Because the verse also says, verse 11, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So imagine the earthquakes and the tsunamis when all the, the, the sub, um, the, the ondergrondse water, the, the subterranean water. Imagine when, when the earth was broken up, the, the force that broke up Plates and plates of, of earth and tectonic um, rock and that water from under the earth gushed out. And all the trees that, that were derooted and then, and then huge waves and tsunamis of water rolling over the, 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 the surface, rolling all the beasts and the animals and the, and the humans and the plants just gushing everything together <clears throat> and eventually like when you put um, ground and mud and um, small rocks and stuff together and twigs in a bottle and you pour water in and you shake the bottle and you leave it and it settles down then you can see how the um, more heavier material settles down at the bottom and then the, the softer mud goes and lies on top. And that's how the oil reserves, the huge amount of oil reserves we have today, that's where it comes from. And I can't remember the movie, there was, there was one movie <laughs> where the grandfather had his own oil company, and it, was, it was called Dino Oil. And the, the son said, yo, we, we are fueling our um, cars on grandpa. <laughs> but it's true, because oil... It's scientific fact. It, it's organic material. And where did so much organic material come from over so-called millions of years? <clears throat> because if a couple of animals and people die and they get laid into the ground and they become organic waste, it doesn't create a dam of oil under the earth. It's just a little bit here and a little bit there and some here and some there. But if we look at the evidence, the scientific, biological, ecological, geographical evidence, huge amounts of oil reserve in certain places where all this organic material just settled down and under pressure it became oil. How can we know 
coil from from that you also get um, steen coil. Um, what is steen coil? Toch na coal. And when coal gets even further down um, under the, the the layers of earth, <clears throat> and there's huge pressure, that eventually become diamonds. So it's interesting. Oil, coal, and diamonds all come from organic material that is human beings and animals and plants from the time of Noah. So yeah, I just love the, the science of the Bible. We can answer many questions that scientists can't even answer. Okay, Genesis 8 verse 1. And Elohim remembered Noah. Do you think that he remembered Noah because he forgot about them? The verse says, and he remembered every living thing and all the cattle that were with Noah in the ark. So does it mean Elohim forgot about them? He brought the waters down from heaven and the waters up from the deep. And Noah built the ark for 120 years. And, and God sent all the animals to come into the ark. And he destroyed everything on the face of the earth. And there is poor Noah and all the animals just... Um, just floating on the water. Do you think God for, forgot about them? Why does the Bible say he remembered them? The Bible also talks about that God remembered Rebekah. And God remembered Hannah. And God remembered this and remembered that. There's a lot of places. And we know that God is absolutely almighty. He's, I mean, he's, he's the perfect, almighty, everlasting one, with all the knowledge and the, and the power, he created the most beautiful flowers and the, the huge waterfalls and mountains. How can he forget? How can he forget poor Noah and all the animals on the ark? It's not, it's not that he forgot. God has a diary. And we find his diary in Leviticus 23. That's all the feasts of the Lord. He's got a diary just like the world has a diary. But, he, but his diary has been, has been his plan long before Moses wrote the actual feast days of the Lord down. And, and God uses his diary and he uses certain dates. Dates for God is very significant, very prophetic. It's not only for, like we discussed before, for the actual time in which it happened. It's always deeply spiritual and it's always prophetic. There's, there's so many layers and layers that we can investigate in every single verse. So God didn't forget. And we'll, we'll get to verse 4 now and you'll see what I mean by his diary. But just like he, he didn't promise Rebecca that um, when, when she started, you, you remember Rebecca was the wife of Isaac and Sarah was the wife of Abraham. Um, Rachel was the wife of Jacob. They were all childless. They were all barren. And they all prayed for many years to receive a child from God. But God says all over the Bible, our time is not his time. And our plans are not his plans. So it's not like he forgot anything, not even one of the prayers that went up to him. It was just that he waited for when the time was ready and then he remembered Rebecca, and she conceived and she bore a son. And he remembered Hannah and she received and bore a son. And he remembered Noah and all the animals. But he remembered, and we'll see that now, he remembered them on a specific day. He didn't forget. He was waiting for a specific day in his diary because of the significance behind it. Okay, but we'll, we'll get to that now. Verse 3, and the water returned from the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the water were abated. So can you imagine all that water that, that was pouring down and coming up from the earth, covering the whole face of the earth so that not even Mount Everest stuck, stuck stood up above the water <clears throat> when God decided it was now the end of it and it stopped raining and it stopped gushing and everything settled down and then 
and then the time came that he abated the water. Now, as you know, when, when a dam wall breaks, the water that gushes out will actually form like a canyon. And you look at all the canyons we have today, and again, scientists will say it took millions of years. There's many dam walls that broke in recent times, and just outside the dam, a little canyon formed. It's beautiful to see. And if any, anybody has ever visited the Grand Canyon, just imagine standing there on the edge of the canyon, looking down all those kilometers, and just imagine being there, what is it, five and a half thousand years ago, looking at all this water gushing towards the ocean, forming this great Grand Canyon. One can just stand in awe to think about what God did when he brought the water and to think what he did when he took the water away again. And it formed the oceans. It went back to the subterranean water, the, the Ondergrondse water. And that's where we have our oceans today. And we can see how, how the water just flowed back into the cavities under earth and flowed back to the oceans. And from there on, when, when it rained, we actually had clouds. The windows of heaven were never opened again. <clears throat> okay, so now let's get to verse 4. And the ark rested in the seventh moon, on the seventeenth day of the moon, upon the mountains of Ararat. Okay, that's cool. So, let's read the next verse. But that's exactly what we've done all our lives. I've, I've never, even in Sunday school, when we discussed Noah's Ark in detail, nobody ever stood still by this verse. You just read over it, your seventh moon, seventeenth day. So what? One of those things. Let's go to the next verse. But that's what I'm trying to show you. God's diary. God's to-do list. God's dates. God's appointed times. Is extremely significant, prophetic, spiritual, and physical. But 99.9% .9 of people reading the Bible will just read over this, this verse and continue to the next. Do you remember I asked you yesterday when we, no, that wasn't yesterday, that was the day before yesterday. But in the previous discussion we had regarding the ark, Noah's ark, and the ark of the covenant, and the way that God actually takes us, his bride, people that believe in him, people that are obedient to him, that come inside the ark, outside of the disobedient and the evil, inside the ark, um, inside the house where the blood of the lamb is upon the doorposts. Those that are inside are being kept safe. And when we start to understand the feasts of the Lord, the feast of the Bible, the biblical feasts. And remember again, I'm going to stress this to you guys. It's not Jewish. There wasn't a Jew in sight in the time of Noah. And yet, I'll show you now, the Bible will show you now what feast this was. There wasn't a Jew in sight. How can this be a Jewish feast? We, we need to look at the feasts that the creator of heaven and earth has put in place. Because he never does anything without a plan behind it and without reason and logic behind it. But keep in mind the significance of being inside the ark. Being part of this earth when the plagues fall. Like Israel was, was inside Egypt when the plagues fell. But it didn't fall upon them. God protected them like he protected Noah inside the ark. And like he was in the ark of the covenant, sitting on the mercy seat, his Shekinah was between the two cherubim on the mercy seat, on the ark of the covenant. And, and the people, as long as they stayed inside the, the camp, they were kept safe all the way through the wilderness, all the way to the promised land. Remember this, because in churchianity, they don't accept the biblical feasts. And that's why when we read this verse, in understanding how amazingly 
Noah and his family and the animals were kept safe and protected during the judgment. And we read and understand the feasts, and we see now in, in verse 4, and we start understanding and, and we bring this back, all these puzzle pieces we bring back to Genesis 1 verse 14, when God placed the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament to calculate the feasts of, of the Lord. Um, Genesis 1 verse 13 and was verse 14, and he put the sun, moon, and stars as days and seasons and times. Physically, yes, days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, seasons, summer, winter, spring, autumn. Times, the the time of, of the of the sun. We know when it's one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. So it's got a physical level, but then it's got a spiritual, deep, prophetic level. In Genesis 1, he already put his clock in place because he's already put his diary in place. He started keeping time and dates already from the beginning. I mean, we read together that even before the foundations of the earth, the Lamb of God was slain. And we know that although we don't celebrate Ishtar, we celebrate Pesach. And Pesach, it has a specific date. And Yeshua even died on the specific hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. The significance of this is tremendous when you study the feast of the Lord and you understand how these feasts um, were celebrated and how it was prophetically showing towards the Messiah and the fulfillment of God's plan as he promised it in Genesis 3.15. He shall bite your heel, but but he, um, he shall crush your head, but you shall shall bite his heel. We have to bring all these little puzzle pieces together if we really want to understand the deception from the tree of knowledge so that we can move away from it and start eating from the tree of life. Okay, where were I? Um, so they were they were kept safe and protected in the inside the ark, and then after all this happened, on this specific day, in the seventh moon, which means the seventh month of the biblical calendar, it doesn't mean it's July, because the Gregorian Gregorian calendar we use today is not the same as, as God's biblical calendar. <clears throat> but in the seventh moon, on the 17th day, this is during the Feast of Tabernacles. From the 15th to the 22nd of the 7th biblical month, we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's astonishing and breathtaking that after everything that happened, how Noah was brought inside the ark, guys, how the judgment fell on those outside the ark, which is represented by the two feasts that comes before tabernacles. And then on the day, um, inside, inside this period that the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated, God brings this ark in which he protected his bride, his people, the people with the seed of the tree of life in them, how he brought them to rest Shabbat, rest in Hebrew Shabbat how he brought them to rest on the mountain. For me, this is just amazing. Out of 365 days, the water has subsided just enough so that the mountain Ararat could become visible. And not just the peak, but a certain flat area so that the ark can rest. And out of 365 days, the ark was on the exact geographical location in the Middle East, not somewhere in London or New York, or there in the Middle East. The ark was just there, um, uh, bopping around on the water, waiting for the water to subside so it can come to rest on that specific mountain. It is amazing. The coincidence of this is just it, it's impossible that it even can be coincidence. During the Feast of Tabernacles, 
having the ark in this specific spot coming to rest. The ark, which we now can agree is the covenant, obedient lifestyle, the narrow path that we walk, in which Yahuwah locked up his bride. Remember, Yahuwah was inside the ark and he locked them in. We, we, we handled that the day before. And in, in this ark in which he protected her during the judgment, it comes to rest on the exact feast of tabernacles of, of all the dates that is there. Those of you who do not any longer celebrate pagan feasts and you've started celebrating Yahuwah's feasts as described in Leviticus 23, you already understand and you're already rehearsing this specific feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. We're rehearsing this feast and we're celebrating it because it's the feast during which our Messiah will tabernacle with us during the millennium reign. We are looking forward to the, to the final feast of tabernacles, the last day of creation, the seventh day, which is, which is the, the Shabbat. 6,000 years we've had this, this circus on the earth during which God has extensively reached out to try and bring his people back. But in the seventh day, we've got, remember we said Peter and the Old Testament said one day for God prophetically is like a thousand years. And even in the seventh thousand year, we've got the millennium, the thousand year peace, the, the reign of peace on this earth when the Messiah reigns. And the Feast of Tabernacles is the prophetic feast we celebrate and we rehearse now, looking forward to the final Feast of Tabernacles. Celebrated um, with history in mind when God brought Israel out of Egypt and they tabernacled with him in the wilderness. But also we celebrate it prophetically, looking towards the future in which Yeshua will bring us from every corner of the earth we discussed this and he will bring us back and we will have a celebration of the feast of tabernacles with our messiah just like god was in the ark of the covenant inside the camp of israel during the wilderness <clears throat> waiting for the time that joshua remember joshua and caleb joshua is the messianic prophetic shadow picture of the messiah when joshua would would take them into the promised land and we're looking forward for when God himself will eventually come down after the thousand years with a new Jerusalem out of heaven to this earth. The new heavens and the new earth. See how even boring history, once you understand the tree of life, how boring history can be so interesting and prophetic. Remember our discussion on kosher. Everything is physical. Noah physically landed on the 17th day of the seventh moon. But it's spiritual. We as the bride, obedient like Noah, withstanding the laughter and the scorn of the world outside the ark, obedient by, by listening to God and doing what he's telling us, like Noah was obedient to build the ark, coming into the ark, allowing God to shut the door, coming in, into our house in Egypt when, when the angel of death came around but couldn't touch us because we had the blood of the lamb on our doorpost and we were inside the house. But it's also prophetic. It's very prophetic. Listen to Deuteronomy 4, verse 27 to 30 again. I've read this many times, but, but this, is, this is God's plan. This is his mission. Remember his mission statement? Um, in the in Genesis 5, the, the Hebrew names of, of the first 10 generations, um, man was appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God will come down, teach him that his death will bring the despairing rest. 
And remember Noah, Noah's name in Hebrew is rest. Noah's father's name in Hebrew was despair. So the despairing through, through Noah, Noah had rest. He came to rest. He was protected inside the ark and he came to rest in, in, the, in the promised land area, in that Middle Eastern area. And he could start over and he could start fresh. And it's the same with us. The despairing, we are despairing on this earth. The earth is going to rubbish. People are rejecting God more than ever before. This, this world is going to rubbish. And the first judgment was water. And God promised he will never use water again. But he, he prophesies all over the Bible. The second judgment will be by fire. And, and we're despairing. But coming into the ark and celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, looking forward to when he will come and tabernacle with us. And we can rest with him and have the Millennium Shabbat with him. Remember this, now we read prophetically Deuteronomy 4, 27 to 30. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen. And you shall serve other gods and other religions. But if from there, if you shall seek Yahuwah your Elohim, you shall find him, if you will seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And he's inside the tab- he's inside the ark. We, we, can, we must come into the ark, into the covenant to find him. Verse 30. When you are in tribulation, tribulation, remember we talked about the book of Revelation being written for us scattered all over the world, coming to belief and faith again in the God of heaven and earth through his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, coming out of these other religions, coming back to him inside the Ark of the Covenant. And when we are in tribulation and all these things come upon you, read here with me, verse 30, when all these things come upon you, even in the last days, then you shall turn to Yahuwah and you shall be obedient unto his voice. So like we know, Revelation twenty two fourteen says, For those that obey his commandments, they'll have access again to the tree of life to come into the gates of the city. So the obedient covenant lifestyle for those in the end times tribulations, we can be safe inside the ark having our faith tested and endure to the end like we discussed before. And then hopefully looking forward in the the firm hope and faith that he will bring us to rest for the Feast of Tabernacles.